All right. Well, good evening, church. Hello once again. Um, I hope you are well this Wednesday evening. I, on the other hand, could be better. Um, I, I don't know what it is. It's earlier today. Just um, I, I don't know. I have no idea why, but just I started getting this uh, headache. So I've had a headache throughout the entire day. And um, for whatever reason, my right eye feels very sensitive. So um, I think I maybe have a, a migraine. Who knows? But I did take some Tylenol, so hopefully I'll be okay. Uh, earlier, Pastor Terry asked God that I would be taken out of the weather instead of under it. So I think, we'll, I think I'm covered, all right? Anyways, with that said, uh, just to kind of get us uh, into the flow of things tonight. Uh, the past couple of Wednesdays, uh, what we've been doing is we've been trying to better understand uh, what it means to be a living sacrifice. And what we've been doing is we've, we've been trying to uh, really understand the significance behind uh, not only that calling or that command, but really that, that gesture, right, of what it means to be a living sacrifice. And I think it's a scripture that we know or we're very familiar with, but what we try to do is understand that better uh, from the perspective of being a Jew, right? So understanding Jewish culture and, and traditions um, and understanding just how uh, their sacrifices that they would bring to the altar of God and how that was something that was, wasn't was taken lightly, but it was done with the extreme diligence, right? Like they took the utmost care into what they would offer before God. And so when Paul calls for the church to be a living sacrifice, it isn't something that we should take lightly or just as a su suggestion, right? It's not like this simple feat, but really it should be seen and also carried out with the uh, utmost adoration to God, right? Meaning that this is what we're going to bring onto the altar of sacrifice. And I'm not, I'm not trying to spend our time reviewing last week, but I think that's important, uh, that's important information to recall, Right, it's important to really recall, well, to recall the essence of being a living sacrifice, something that's holy and acceptable to God, because it is by that same charge that we are also called to be the body of Christ. And so, in Romans chapter twelve, verses one to two, I don't think that's something that should be separated from what is going to be addressed afterwards, right? But it's with that mentality, it's with that mindset, it's with that heart. Um, that it serves really as a primer um, for what Paul will address in verses 3 to 8, which will be our uh, scripture of study tonight. So um, without further ado, if we could go ahead and read our scripture tonight. And as always, if you could join us in standing uh, out of reverence for God's holy and living word as it's being read. But this is what it says. Once again, I think this is another scripture uh, many are familiar with. Starting with verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members, of, members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If, prophes if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us go ahead and uh, get comfortable uh, tonight. You see, what, what, what we see in, in chapter 3 is Paul taking what it means to be a living sacrifice and transition into how we might be a living sacrifice, not just individually, but collectively as a church. And, and one of the things that I appreciate about what Paul is presenting to the church and to us is how we live out being a living sacrifice that is going to be different. It's not going to be all, it's not going to be the same all across the board. However, the goal, right, is right, as a church is to be in unison, right? As a church, the goal, the thing that we should strive for is to be working in harmony, 
We should be um, intentional about being on the same page. However, the execution of those goals and how we contribute toward that is going to be similar. It's going to be familiar. But as we learn, it is not going to be the same. That is, unless we share the same gifts. And the possibility of it being the same becomes more likely. But for the majority, the way that you and I contribute to the body of Christ, the way that you and I contribute to the things that God has put in front of us or the overall goal of spreading the gospel and being the light uh, into this world is going to look different even though we are working together, working toward the same goal. But why is that? Why is it that even though we're working toward the same thing, the way that we contribute and the way that we uphold the unison of the body of Christ, why is it going to look different? And the reason being, is, as we are already aware of, is that there are many gifts. Right? There are many different gifts. And they are all different in how they are not only embodied, but how they are practiced and how they are lived out. Right? This is going to look different. And with us being human beings, right, a.k.a. sinful human beings who are saved by grace, then the danger that we run into and the reason why Paul has to address these things and kind of lay them out is because we are in danger of looking at each other's gifts and being like, how come I didn't get that? Or I, 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 I know I have a gift, but I would much rather have yours. Or then if we kind of, zoom into that a little bit more, what usually ends up happening is we go, why did he get that gift? I would have been so much better at that. And so what we see being produced in our hearts as we look at each other and start to compare is we become envious, we become bitter, and some might even become upset. And so what Paul is doing is he's setting the record straight from the very beginning and establishing the basis and credentials for each person in their, and their gifts. So if we look at verse 3, all right, let's go ahead and look at verse 3. Verse 3 says this, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. Right, the key phrase is sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. And so what we see from the get-go is Paul setting the record straight. He's establishing the baseline for all of these things. Why? Because he knows that there will be potentially some issues. And I would imagine this is something that Paul has seen in his time being in heavily involved in the Jewish synagogues and so forth. And the way that people would talk about others and how they would act out of their enviness. Right? We see that, we see that even in today's society. Right? It's the reality of our human nature. You see, we tend to want the gifts that end up having more of the spotlight. Right, for a lot of people, when they, when they think about gifts and the way that they can serve the church, oftentimes we want those, those gifts that might feel a little bit more rewarding or prestigious, right? Or receive more of the instant recognition and gratification. But that's not for everyone. And the reason why is because it is God who gives the gifts. And so what Paul is laying out is like he's like, you, you, you have what you have. Not because you have achieved it or because you are so deserving of it, but simply because it is God who gives the gift. Why? So that no one would think that they are higher or better than others. Right? These are God-given gifts. And so that's why it's important for us to pay attention that when, when Paul says, hey, you need to look at this. You need to see this not from your own selfishness or what you think is right or what is deserving on, on your end. But you need to view these things with sober judgment. So then when we think about it, like, how are these gifts determined? Or how, how does God see fit to give certain individuals certain things, right? And what, our, what Paul says is according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So then we have to ask the question, what is the measure of faith? Or how does something like that get, get measured, right? Like what, what's, what's the protocol behind that? And I think John MacArthur adds uh, um, 
explains it well, right? And he says this. He says, in this context, a measure of faith seems to refer to the correct measure of the spiritual gift and its operating features that God sovereignly bestows on every believer. Every believer receives the exact gift and resources best suited to fulfill his role in the body of Christ. Every person has his own special but limited set, set of capabilities. Trying to operate outside those capabilities produces frustration, discouragement, feelings of guilt, mediocrity, and ultimate defeat. We fulfill our calling when we function according to God's sovereign desire, uh, design for us. Right? Every person has his own special but limited set of capabilities. And where we go wrong or where things go south is when we try to operate outside of those capabilities. You see, if, if we think about it a, a little bit more deeply, or if we're trying to understand what is the measure of faith, or if we're trying to think about this uh, more deeply or think of this in, in a way that can be more encouraging to us is, well, the first one is this. The gift that you have right now or the gift that you feel that you possess, that is according to the measure of your faith as it stands. Right? So what that means is in the, in, in the capacity that you are operating right now in terms of what you think is your God-given capability and gifts, you're, those are things that are being bestowed to you as a result of where your faith stands. If we're using... The, the term, the, the coin phrase, measure of faith that Paul is presenting to us. But then if we want to, right, that's, I think that's the first part. But then the second part, which is something that should be uh, more encouraging to us, is that we understand, right, if there's a measure of faith, and then we think about the faith in our own lives, we, we like to believe that what? Our faith has the ability to grow. Our faith has the ability to, to increase, right? It's a cry, we're going to give me more faith. But what we also learn in, in, in our walking with Christ, in our trusting in Christ, is that our faith has the ability to what? Mature. Right? That's why we, that's why we see something along the lines of, by this time, you ought to be teachers. Right? By this time, you ought to have moved on to what? The solid foods, not the, the milk, not the elementary truths of the gospel. So what we understand is that there is, a, there is room for growth. And so if that is the case, so that we are not chasing gifts, but God is a gift giver and gives according to the measure of faith that he sees fit, then that should give us something to strive for. And, and, and I could be wrong, right, because obviously God is the one who gives the gifts. But does, it, does that not mean that as I'm growing in my relationship with Christ, as I'm doing my best to faithfully walk with Christ, that as the faith in my life is increasing, does it not mean that God is willing or able to give me what? More gifts. Right? It doesn't mean that once a teacher, always a teacher. But in that season... Right, in that place you are in your faith, maybe for with the X amount of days, months, or years, you're called to be a teacher. But then as you grow and as you mature and as you gain experience, as you're walking with Christ more intimately, it's possible that God might say, hey, it's time to go into this now. And I, I think for us, that should be something that we could look forward to. And, it, I, it is, and there's nothing wrong for wanting to be a teacher. Right? I think it's great to want to fine-tune your craft. But this is speaking to the, the possibilities, right? And we don't know because God, God who, is God who is the gift give, giver, right? So why do we need to have sound, sound judgment about this? Right? Why, why does Paul say that you need to understand or you need to see this from a place of sober judgment? And I think it's because ultimately, right, there's a coin phrase that comparison is the biggest thief of what? Joy. Meaning that it that when we start to compare, when we start to see things from a, 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 a place of bitterness, it, it prevents us from seeing things from the perspective of why God has put us in this place. Right? That, that means that when, when, 
when we when we when scripture calls for us to have sound moral you know sober judgment however you want to describe it what that means is that i can't get caught up in looking at my gift in discontentment while i am envious of someone else's gift but god has given us a gift for a reason and for a purpose and at times it may not seem like it's the most rewarding i understand that at times it might seem like it's, it's the dirty work right like if this if we are a uh, uh a Michelin star restaurant, right? who's, who's going to be excited about washing the dishes? Nobody, right? But washing the dish, dishes is equally important, right? But it just may not receive the same recognition or prestige that other roles have. Warren Wearsby says, each Christian must know what his spiritual gifts are and what ministry or ministries he is to have in the local church. It is not wrong for a Christian to recognize gifts in his own life and in the lives of others. What is wrong is the tendency to have a false evaluation of ourselves. Nothing causes more damage in a local church than a believer who overrates himself and tries to perform a ministry that he cannot do. But for whatever reasons, there are times where we like to do it, right? We, we, we say, I, I could do a better job. Or he's not doing it right. And instead of appreciating the work that is, being, uh, that is unfolding before our very own eyes, we, we nitpick. We complain about the little things that we have no business complaining about. And we try to justify not only our complaints, but our reasons for wanting to do what somebody else has been entrusted to do. And so the flip side is that instead of being the complainer, we need to figure out ways to be encouraging. Right? We need to figure out ways to be affirming. We need to figure out ways to offer helpful criticism, constructive criticism when necessary. Not when it's unwarranted, but when it is necessary. And we'll see that a little bit later, right? Because all of this is about building up the church. So then when we look at verses 4 to 5, verses 4 to 5 go on to say this. For as in one body... We have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Right? And so the best way to summarize this is that, and I know we're very familiar with the, these parts of this uh, passage. But the best way to summarize this is that there is, what, one body with many moving pieces. And each part has a different function. Everything is moving for a greater goal. You know, everyone doesn't have the same function. And if they did, the body would fail to operate properly. And so for me, every time I, I come across this, this particular passage, one of the things that always comes to mind is, is the function of our, of, of our leg, Right? And um, the only reason I, I, I know a little bit more than I should is because after, sub, uh, after sustaining some knee injuries, right, you learn that there are so many uh, moving parts in the construction of your knee to stabilize it and to add comfort, right? And so one of the, my most recent injuries is I have probably slightly torn the meniscus in cartilage in my knee. And so what happens is instead of it operating smoothly, it has a tendency to kind of lock up and kind of make you feel like you're going to fall over, right? But the knee is constructed with all these ligaments that add stability. And the moment that one of those is compromised, the, o- the others have to overcompensate, right? But the, 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 but the way that it's designed is so that it can operate and function not just accordingly but to its maximum capability, Right? There are all many different moving parts serving one purpose. And so when we think about that, right, the, 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 the idea of function. Right? The Greek word for function comes from, the, uh, the Greek word for function comes from praxis. And it has the basic meaning of doing something that is a, a deed. And what happens is that this word has evolved over time and it has uh, a later came to mean something that was ordinarily done or practiced, right? It was meant to uh, communicate a normal function. But as it's used in Scripture, it's meant to refer to what we know as spiritual gifts. And so expanding his metaphor, Paul reminds us of what we all know, that our members, such as our hands or feet, do not have the same functions as what something like the eyes, right? We know this. 
And so an illustration that I came across in, in preparing for tonight was, was it, it, it was this. And I, I don't know if it's a true story. Hopefully it is. But after World War II, uh, a group of German students volunteered to help rebuild an English cathedral that had been severely damaged by uh, bombs that had, were dropped by the Germans during this time. And as work progressed, they became concerned about a large statue of Jesus, whose arms were outstretched and beneath which was and beneath which was the inscription, "Come unto me." So originally, right, the statue was like had Jesus' outstretched arms like this, and had the inscription underneath, "Come unto me." But what ha- what happened is that they had a particular difficult time trying to restore the hands which had been completely destroyed. And so after much discussion, they decided to uh, let the hands remain missing and change the inscription to Christ has no hands but ours. Right? The function of the body. Are we, we are truly called to be what the hands and feet of Christ or for Christ in this world and for others to see and experience, but more importantly, benefit from. Right? The world needs to benefit from the church being the hands, being the feet, going to places that people are unwilling to go, willing to do things that may not necessarily be the most prestigious or rewarding. Right? We don't need the same functions, but we need to work in unison to accomplish the things that Christ has redeemed us for. Right? We have been redeemed. We have been reconciled with a purpose. So even as the health and welfare of the human, be, uh, human body depend on the proper functioning of each member, so does the spiritual vitality and the impact of the, uh, of, the, of the church as the body of Christ's life on the lost world. Right? As it depends on the proper use and interaction of all the spiritual gifts from all the members of the body of Christ. We, we, are, we are redeemed, right? We have been given an identity and we have been given gifts as, a, as our way of not only serving God, but being used by him. John Donne wrote a poem called No Man is an Island. And this was in response to a lot of Christians during this time having this Lone Ranger type of Christianity, that he saw people trying to live, right? If you don't know what a lone ranger is, they just want to do things by themselves. They wanted to be by themselves. They wanted to be alone. They wanted to be isolated when in actuality that is anti-gospel, right? That's anti what God has called us to do. And in his poem he says, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less as well as uh, promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bells toll if tolls for thee. We're not called to be on an island of Christianity, but we are called to be a part of what? The, the, the continent. We are called to be a part of the greater, the, the greater um, population of the body of Christ. But we have to understand that not only are we many members of the body, each one is not only vital, but necessary. And so when we, when we, when we are trying to encourage a church, the the vibe and the encouragement that we need to give off is that we need to communicate not just with words but with actions is that every person is important. Every person is necessary. Professor Hodge in his commentary on Romans gives us some practical information uh, regarding the oneness of the body of Christ. I know it's a lot up there, right? And it's, it's kind of hard to read. But I wanted to share with you everything that he writes. But he says, believers, though many, are one body in Christ and every one members, and every one members of one another. We, the many, are one body. In one respect, we are many. In another, we are just one. 
just as a body is many as as to its members and one in their organic connection. Believers are one body, a living organic whole, not in virtue of any external organization, but in Christ, in virtue of of their common union with him. And as with this union with Christ is not merely external or by profession or by unity of opinion or sentiment only, but vital arising from the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Christ. So the apostle, as the union of believers, one with one another, is also a vital union. They are every one members, one of another. The relation of believers to each other is far more intimate than that between the members of any external organization, whether civil or ecclesiastical, right? It is analogous to the mutual relation of the members of the same body animated by one soul, right? The, the key thing is what's vital, is vital to the operation. This It's not just a, a, a theory, it's not just a, 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 a well-intentioned, but it is necessary. The oneness that you and I have as a result of who Christ is and because God has given us his Holy Spirit. Lastly, as we get to wrap things up for tonight, and we'll come back to this in a couple of weeks when it's my turn on the rotation again, but verses 6 to 8 bring some clarity but also boundaries to the gifts when Paul says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with a zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Right, we, 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 we can spend our, our time trying to understand what these gifts are, what they practically look like, but we'll, we'll save that for another day. But what we see with... The, what, 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 what we see is that the gifts that, uh, that differ and is based off of the grace given to us. And once again, grace is something that is not earned. It is simply gifted to us because God is the gift giver. He is the gifter. You know, I, I do find it interesting that Paul has to say, let us use them. Right? Let us use the gifts. You know, the reason why I find that interesting is, like, that's something that should be obvious or something that should be implied. Like, if God is giving you an ability, you should use it. But once again, if we lack that sober judgment, then what do we do? We end up looking at someone else's and say, I don't want this gift. I'd rather have yours. Or I don't want this gift. Like, I could do your gift so much better. When in actuality, we have to see that, you know, God has given us our gifts for reason. And so come to find out. Um, that these words, right, let us use them is not something that was in the original Greek text. But given the context and the situation, I can see how it's necessary to add them because, like I mentioned earlier, right, if you, it's easy to lose sight of what you have when you're looking around at what others have. Right, but these spiritual gifts are given to us for a reason. These spiritual gifts are given to the church for a a purpose, right? These spiritual gifts are given to the church so that we would operate in a way that it makes us unified, that would give us cohesion, right? So spiritual gifts, I I, I found this, right? These are the S's of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are supernatural abilities, meaning they're not from us, or they are not of us. And because they're not of us, they are sovereignly given, but why are they sovereignly given to us? Because God is using them as a means to strengthen his saints who have been saved and redeemed to serve one another, being good stewards of what God has given us. Right? They're supernatural abilities. I mean that if God didn't give them to me, I wouldn't have them. But they are God-given, which makes them you know, sovereignly given. But they're used to not only strengthen us, but to edify us. 
right? What they're what they're given to us, they're, they're given to us to to build us up continuously in our identity in Christ. And what it teaches us is to continually lean onto God and to trust Him because He has given us these things, right? God gives differing gifts to different people. And the ones listed in verses 6 to 8 are what? Prophecy, service, teaching, being a contributor, being a leader, acts of mercy. Right? Each believer's gift is a God-designed blend of spiritual capabilities, which acts as a channel through which the Spirit of God ministers to others. Right? God sovereignly bestows these spiritual gifts on believers according to his divine will, meaning that if you have it, God intends to use you while using that gift. You see, apart from any merit or qualification or whatever the case might be, right? It's unfortunately, even though God has given us these things and God is wanting to use us because of our sinful nature, where right, our pride tends to get in the way, right? It tends to get in our heads. It causes us to see things uh, not from the, the purest of perspectives. Right? This, this sinful attitude of ours can be self-inflicted, but can also energize others who insist on, in, who in, insist on exalting themselves over how God has blessed them and gifted them. Right? There, there's, there are many gifts. And once again, some are more prestigious than others, but it doesn't mean that it's any less important or any less unnecessary. Warren Wiersbe, right, we'll close with this quote. He adds, spiritual gifts are tools to build with, not toys to play with or weapons to fight with. Right, spiritual gifts are tools to build up the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts are tools to further the gospel. Spiritual gifts are tools that are meant to uh, Enable us and equip us to really be the hands and the feet, right? The, the spiritual gifts are, are tools meant for us to speak into other people's lives. They're meant, they're, they're given to us so that someone would be able, to, will be great sharers of the gospel. Right? Spiritual gifts are given to us so that some of us would be great evangelists. Some people are are are, are way better uh, prayer warriors than. Ourselves, not that we aren't called to be prayer warriors, but there are some others who are just really good at what praying for others. There are others who are able to better discern what God is doing in our lives, even though that's kind of a cool gift to have. I can understand why some might be envious of that. But we all play a vital role, right? Not to build up ourselves, not to uh, earn you know, accolades or any of, the, any of those things, but God has given us these spiritual gifts to serve one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to do the work that he has set out for us. And the way that we start that is by being what? Is by presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice to serve the body of Christ. Saying, God, if this is the gift that you're, you're going to give me, I want to I use it. I want to serve you faithfully. God, that other gift looks great, and in your time, if at any point you see me fit, having that gift, like, I'll take it. But in the, in the meantime, the gift that you have given me, I will, I will use it to serve you, to serve your church, to serve the body of Christ. Because I understand that I have a vital function in your church and in the body that you have placed me in. And so my prayer is this, that we would, wouldn't be envious of others, but that we would really see the beauty in what God is bestowing to us. And if we feel like it's anything less than what we deserve or we feel like we deserve more, then I would encourage you to take your faith and say, God, I want, I want, I want more. And when you see fit, God, would you give me other gifts so that I can serve you in this capacity as well. We are called to be the church. Many members, many members, all with fun- different functioning parts. But may we work in unison to function beautifully as the body of Christ. Amen. The body of Christ is gifted. It is heavily gifted. May we use them for his kingdom and for his glory. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for tonight. We just thank you for this great reminder. I know that this is a scripture that we are, uh, I would imagine, to be fairly 
uh, familiar with. But Father, I pray that it would speak to us in a way, that your word would speak to us in a way that reminds us of the calling. It would remind us of the many gifts that you have given us. It would remind us of the season that we're in and how you intend to use us. And Father, I pray that as those things become uh, clearer, uh, that God, we would be more intentional about serving you and, and really living for your kingdom and, and for your glory. Father, we, we thank you for the way that you uh, love us. And we thank you that you would even see us fit uh, to have gifts from you to be used by you. And so, Father, we thank you for that as well. And now we just ask that the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that the everlasting love of God our Father, and may the anointing, the power, and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit truly be with us until we meet in your house once again. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. May you go in peace. And then just one announcement.